The Rules Committee will come to order. Good morning. Uh, last week, the committee met and took testimony on H.R. 5525, the Continuing Appropriations and Border Security Enhancement Act of 2024. Today, we'll move forward on a new rule to provide for consideration of this important legislation. As I've repeatedly noted, it's critical that Congress comes together and passes legislation to fund the government. Yet we must also recognize that we cannot continue to spend in the same way as the previous majority did. I believe this bill will allow us to continue those important conversations with the Senate. I'll now yield to our distinguished ranking member, my very good friend, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief here. But, um, you know, I, I woke up this morning thinking it was Friday the 13th. Um, but uh, then I looked at my calendar and saw it was Friday the 29th, uh, which is scarier because we are one day away uh, from a MAGA Republican government shutdown. And, um, and I'm trying to, again, we just received uh, the information on what's contained in this, uh, in this new bill, and I'm, we're trying to digest um, all that uh, there is here, uh, but it seems to me that this is just doubling down on, on, on the cruel. Um, this version of the Freedom Caucus CR, uh, in addition to, if I understand this correctly, in addition to exempting the Pentagon from any spending cuts, also now exempts the Department of Homeland Security from cuts. I, and I, I guess I will we'll take credit for pointing out the fact that your previous efforts uh, were cutting uh, border security. Uh, but uh, these new exemptions mean that there are, that, that there are far worse cuts and everything else. Uh, deeper cuts to cancer research, deeper cuts to air traffic safety, deeper cuts to mental health resources, deeper cuts to fuel assistance, deeper cuts to WIC, Deeper cuts to Meals on Wheels, deeper cuts to LIHEAP, deeper cuts to Head Start. I mean, we're, we're talking about a 57% cut to wildfire suppression, a 74% cut uh, to a program that ensures that Americans can stay warm in the winter, a 74% cut. Uh, I mean, uh, and, 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 and I guess this new CR now includes a, a debt commission, which is essentially just another tool for this majority to go after Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. Um, and it includes uh, some of the most extreme policies from HR2. Um, I mean, I, 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 the way I'm reading this is that there's like a 30 percent cut uh, in the in USDA. Does anyone know what? Does that mean there's a 30% cut in WIC? I, mean, I don't know who wrote this, but does anyone know what, if, if, I, if I'm understanding that correctly? Uh, or how many people will lose WIC if this cut stays into place? Um, okay. Um, I, I am, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're told that, um, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there's cuts to everything. There's cuts to everything in here. Uh, and one is, we are one day away from a government shutdown. What we are doing here today doesn't get us any closer to avoiding a government shutdown. And in fact, what is really disturbing is it seems that the Republicans are moving farther and farther away from a point where we could actually have a compromise and get something done. Um, and so I guess for my friends on the other side of the aisle who have been cheering on a shutdown for quite some time, um, you will get your wish. Um, and, I, and again, for the life of me, I, I, I can't even see how this passes on the House floor. Um, I guess I, I, was, I was a little bit relieved to see that, um, that, that this rule doesn't deem past the crummy ag appropriation bills that went down to historic defeat yesterday. Uh, but then, um, because I know my Republican friends sometimes are trying to find new ways to not respect the vote, but when I look at what this CR does, um, I mean, it's just as bad. So I don't know how anybody who voted against the Ag Appropriations Bill could possibly vote for this on the House floor. So, um, I, you know, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't know what else to, to say other than um, I can't believe we're doing this. Uh, and um, I mean, a 74% cut to LIHEAP, 
57 percent cut to wildfire suppression, uh, a 30 percent cut across the board in, in WIC and everything else. I'm told that a million seniors will lose their meals on wheels if this were to become enacted. So in any event, I, um, I have uh, nothing else to, to add, and uh, let's, let's get on with this and, and I hope it fails and we can then, you know, figure out what the next step is. I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee grant HR 5525, the Continuing Appropriations and Border Security Enhancement Act 2024, uh, a closed rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides the amendments printed in the Rules Committee report shall be considered as adopted, and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations or the respective designees. The rule provides one motion to recommit. Finally, the rule provides that upon passage of H.R. 5525, the title of such bill is amended to read as follows, reducing spending, securing the border, and for other purposes. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, you've now heard the motions. Is there any discussion or amendment to the rule? I have an amendment to the rule, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's recognized. Um, I move the committee amend the self-executing manager's amendment to prohibit the new fiscal commission from issuing any recommendations that would cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And let me just say that I offer this amendment because while my friends across the aisle have claimed they do not plan to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, I frankly have my doubts, especially with the addition of this provision self-executed into the CR text that creates a fiscal commission to, to study debt. Uh, with only days before funding for the government runs out, bu uh, budget committee Republicans marked up a budget resolution that favors the wealthy and well-connected overworking families, uh, one that makes massive cuts to the critical programs Americans rely on. And if enacted, uh, the extreme MAGA Republican budget resolution would lead to devastating budget cuts that would strip away access to affordable health care, raise the price of essential goods, and let families go hungry, and all the while laying the foundation for new tax giveaways to the ultra-wealthy. And my fear is that this debt commission, which was airdropped into the CR late last night or early this morning, will follow the same shameful blueprint set out by the Budget Committee. So I'm offering this amendment to prevent the commission from um, giving my friends an excuse to cut some of the most critical programs uh, uh, for the vulnerable and for our senior citizens. I want to ensure that when this commission examines ways to reduce the national debt, it won't be on the backs of the recipients of Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. These are vital programs that have been the foundation of our nation's economic and health security, uplifting generations of Americans. They shouldn't be eviscerated to appease extreme Republicans, and I urge a yes vote on my motion. I yield back. No, thank you, gentlemen. I just note for the record that uh, the Debt Commission has Democratic representation on it. It, uh, it specifically has to move in a bipartisan fashion. And uh, I very seriously doubt that uh, my friends would put people on there that uh, uh, would uh, adopt the measures that he fears. So I think there's adequate protection actually built into the Commission itself. Uh, is there any further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chairman? Uh, gentleman's recognized. I, th I think the Chairman. I support the ranking member's amendment, and in part, I support it because while I have great respect for the chairman, I, I disagree with his description of the, the views uh, espoused by some of the members in his conference who have made it abundantly clear that this commission has one purpose, one purpose alone, and that is to slash programs like Social Security and Medicare. And, and I don't think that they're particularly unabashed about it. Mr. Norman and I have had exchanges in the past, and I'm happy to give him an opportunity if he cares to clarify that, that, but you, you have not been shy in telegraphing your view about the cuts and reforms that you'd like to make to Social Security and Medicare, and that this commission is a vehicle to achieve that, or am I not, is that not your view? No, I never brought up Social Security, never brought up Medicaid, Medicare. What I have brought up is we've got to get this country back on the firm financial footing. My good friends on the other aisle don't cut anything, and you bring up you know, the specifics of programs that just mainly to inspire the, or excite the, uh, what I guess you consider your base is. We don't... Uh, well, let me, let me know, reclaim my time. I, I'm surprised that you would make the case that you've never proposed any changes to Social Security and Medicare. I've heard you say that in this committee. I, I don't have the statements in front of me, but if you want to walk back 
from those you can. No, I'm not walking back. I, you know, there is a time we're going to have to get real with, uh, rather than have Social Security go bankrupt in, what, 70, 2035? Why, rather than have uh, the mandatory, we have got to address at some point. None of these address any of that, nor would we cut that now. We've got our hands full with the 30 percent that needs to be cut. It's, we got a bloated government now. So. Yeah. Well, again, I think the American people understand that when a group of members on your side of the aisle, and I, and, and I counted you among them, at least uh, I, I suppose, again, you, maybe you've changed your tune the last couple of days, but uh, make very clear that they would like to cut these vital programs and create a vehicle through this so-called debt commission to achieve it. Uh, the fact that, that you might change your view today does nothing to change the underlying facts or the reality for the American people and what this commission would ultimately accomplish. Uh, look, I'll just say more broadly, I support the ranking member's amendment, but I can remember a day, eight, nine months ago, when I was told by my friends on the other side of the aisle that there was a new day in Washington, the days of backroom deals with leadership crafting large bills or CRs or what have you, and then bringing them to this committee in the dead of night, posting them, what time was this posted? I don't know, midnight, one o'clock last night, and then telling your members that they're all expected to vote the same day on the, the text of that bill. I thought those days were done. That's what I heard from my colleague from Kentucky and from Texas. Well, I, I don't understand. I spent days on the floor listening to theatrical speeches about the new norms in Washington, D.C., the, the fight against the establishment. Lo and behold, I wake up and uh, the very people claiming that those days were done are now the, the people who are engaging in it. This is regular order? This is the regular order that you spoke of? These are the reforms you spoke of? CRs posted in the dead of night? Telling 435 members, get ready, you're going to vote on it in a few hours? Man, uh, I, I, I am surprised and disappointed to say nothing, of course, of the substance of this bill, which uh, Ranking Member McGovern articulated well. Uh, you know, you, the House Republican Conference has been, as I said in prior meetings, engineering a government shutdown for weeks. And apparently, they're getting their wish because this CR, in effect, is a shutdown of the government. I, I don't know what else you call defunding the FBI and the DEA. What, what do you call that? What, what do you call cuts that literally will mean there are less FBI agents, DEA agents, state and local officer cuts by virtue of the grant programs and partnerships that exist between the Department of Justice and our local law enforcement officers? What else do you call that? What else do you call a 57% cut to wildland firefighter suppression? What do you call that in the wake of Maui and devastating wildfires across the Rocky Mountain West in my state in Colorado? We've got a bipartisan coalition where we've been trying to fight to increase wildland fire suppression. I guess I'm going to have to go find these, these colleagues that I was working with and ask them why they've decided to abandon that effort and vote for these draconian cuts. You know, I, the final thing I will say, and I want to yield to my colleague from Pennsylvania, but I understand for some of my colleagues, this is purely ideological. They believe, I, I take Mr. Norman, you know, with respect to his description of, of uh, government and how he sees it, at his word, you know, he, he has said he wants to slash spending, right? You've said that. That's not more as a broadly a broad principle, right? And that's what you intend to do in this bill. What surprises me are the members in your caucus, so-called moderates, people who claim that they they're here for the good of the order, they're going to work across party lines, that they don't want to see any of these terrible consequences happen and then yet go straight to the floor and vote in favor of it. That's what surprises me. All these members for weeks on TV, members of your conference, calling your conference 
the clown show and all the rest. These th- I mean, these are not my words. These are their words. And then what do they do? In an hour and a half, they'll march to the floor and vote for a rule that cuts funding for FBI agents and DEA agents and wildland fire suppression and God knows what else that you put in this CR that you published eight hours ago. That's what they'll do. It's what we've grown and come accustomed to expect. But I can tell you the American people are watching, and they don't like what they're seeing. So with that, I'll yield to my colleague in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Um, just with respect to this um, debt commission or what it's, whatever it's called, if it were actually to come into being, like everything else that the House majority has proposed, it focuses <clears throat> only on cutting vital services to the American people because you are so unwilling to address the fact that we need more revenue and that the Trump tax cuts had a devastating impact on our national debt, adding trillions to the national debt. So, you know, if you're serious about a debt commission, then let's start with the fact that you're creating the crisis that you're now claiming to solve on the backs of the American people, on the backs of children who aren't going to have teachers because of 80% cuts to Title I. After all the whining we've heard across the aisle about the impact of shutdowns on kids, now you're going to cut funding for their schools. You're going to get cut funding for their school lunches. You're going to cut funding for SNAP and WIC. You're going to force people in D.C. You're going to force the Capitol Police to work without pay. You're going to force TSA and um, all these government services who aren't furloughed to work without pay. So I hope you're proud of yourselves. The preening and posturing that we have seen for the last two weeks is really hard to take. I think you all deserve a big timeout. I hope you get one. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm going to support the ranking member's amendment, and I yield back to Mr. Nadeus. And I yield back to him. Thank you very much. General from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to point out, this language on the CR has been out for, I believe, two weeks now. We actually had a hearing on it. There's been very slight changes. The one change that was made that we talked about is the commission. And the commission is to strengthen and secure these programs so they're around for future generations. It's not to dismantle these programs, quite the opposite. And just a point of hypocrisy, I've heard for days and weeks now throughout this process that we need to be bipartisan, that we need to reach across the aisle. Here in this rule calls for a commission that dictates it has to be bipartisan. So I would ask who's being partisan, not voting for a rule calling for a bipartisan commission. With that, I yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Uh, gentleman's recognized. Yeah, I, and, and again, I, I have great respect for the gentleman from Pennsylvania, but he said there's only one minor change in this bill. That's not correct. That's not correct. I mean, the, there are deeper cuts in this bill. That's a huge change. I mean, there are there are other things in this bill that were not in the uh, in the uh, CR that we talked about before. So, I, I think if the gentleman thinks there's only one change in this bill, then I think he makes the point of Mr. Goose, and that is that people need a little bit more time to read what was in this bill. I mean, the cuts I, in LIHEAP alone are now at 74 percent. So, the, the idea there's one minor change, and this is all partisan. That's just not accurate. But I have great respect for the gentleman and. Uh, Look forward to hearing more from him when I think I don't know if you're doing this on the floor or not, but anyway, um, I, I, I yield back. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Is there any further Mr. discussion Chairman. on yeah. the amendment? Yeah. The gentleman from Texas sure. recognized. Just, just one thing adding to, to my friend from Pennsylvania, um, the spirit of what the gentleman was talking about. Um, everything that is changed substantively fits on a third of a piece of paper, half a piece of paper. Like four lines. Um, that's the truth. There's 24, hold on a second. There's 24 pages of a debt commission, okay? Uh, a debt commission which my colleagues on the side, uh, other side of the aisle uh, belied a moment ago um, in saying, uh, you know, that it was somehow, uh, you know, designed to target Medicare, Social Security, and so forth. Well, my question for my colleagues is, if we, if we can't have a serious co- uh, conversation about reducing non-mandatory spending, which is what my colleagues here are rejecting, and you can reject the percentage, you can reject the nature and so forth. By the way, we're talking about 30 days. 
and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle utterly refuse to address the size and scope of the federal government at all. Zero. This is no utterly refusal. And then and this and the sit here and say, oh, well, we can't have a debt commission because Medicare and Social Security might be brought up. That's, that's, that's of not, course they'll be brought up. That's what of course mean. they should be addressed. Of course we need to deal with Medicare and Social Security. And the question with my colleagues is, what would be the proposal? We can have a debate about ages. We can have a debate about what to do about how to keep them solvent. The only answer from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle is revenue. The only answer I've ever heard in my time in Congress, the only answer to address $33 trillion of debt and a $2 trillion deficit is revenue. The only answer. Meanwhile, the CBO, quote, this is the Congressional Budget Office. Revenues received by the federal government in 2022 totaled $4.9 trillion, of which more than half was receipts from individual income taxes, which were the highest ever as a percentage of gross domestic product. If you look at the overall revenue of the United States, we, can, we, we might be able to tweak the levers and get a little more revenue or reduce a little bit more revenue, all in the context, by the way, of figuring out economic growth. And we could have that debate, happy to have that debate about what taxes should be. But the goal here is we've got to figure out how to address the fact that we have for my entire lifetime, for the most part, had nothing to offer to change the spending trajectory in this town. You can disagree with focusing on discretionary versus mandatory, but to criticize that in a bill offered last night five or so lines of changes, meaningful changes in impact in terms of the percentage, but, but to say, oh, that's somehow violative of process when you're saying, well, what are you going to do when you have any kind of a change with respect to a funding bill like we're talking about? We're debating the percentages, debating what the numbers should look like. But the legislation, as my friend from Pennsylvania pointed out, has been out for two weeks. There's, there was a change last night to the numbers. A gentleman pointed out that there was a Department of Homeland Security adjustment. I'd be happy to cut the Department of Homeland Security some. I'd be happy to cut the Pentagon some. That would be my choice. That would be my preference. But we've got to work through the body in the deliberative process to figure out which ones we're going to cut. If the general will yield? I'll yield on that. Yeah, well, for, first of all, my, my amendment doesn't say that it doesn't ban the commission. It just says you can't, you can't cut Social Security or Medicare. And there are other ways to be able to address the long-term viability of that program. Secondly, I'm, if the general wants to cut the Pentagon a budget, the, the uh, weapon systems that are that with all these cost overruns, I'm happy to join with him. But th this bill doesn't do that. You specifically protect it. Protect that, and the idea that we're and that we're saying that there's only minor changes. The idea that you're going from an eight percent cut to a thirty percent cut is huge, and the idea that nobody could tell me what the impact on WIC was going to be, and we're about to vote on this. I mean, that nobody could tell me how many people will lose their meals on wheels as a result of this. I mean, that's a that, that is that's substantial. That's why there should be discussion. That's why there should be more hearings on what are the impact of these cuts, and it's like, no big deal. There are real people behind these cuts. But in any event, I appreciate the There's gentleman's comments. You guys have kind of made clear where you're coming from. I, you don't agree with this amendment, fine, vote it down, and you know we'll go to the floor and I would note, I would note that my colleagues didn't agree with the 8% cut either. Uh, uh, my colleagues, I'm, I don't think my colleagues would agree to a 2% cut, a 4% cut, a 12% cut, a 40% cut. Uh, the fact is, there's zero cut that we could put in here that would be uh, an across-the-board cut to manage what we're dealing with. Yeah, but, yeah but, but, the, but, those, but the cuts with respect to the... Just remind people... Just remind uh, people, please don't talk over one another. It's very difficult for the stenographer. Gentleman uh, from Texas Control. In, in terms of continuing to perpetuate government that we're talking about right now, we could put forward any spent... That 8% cut reflected the Fiscal Responsibility Act. The question was whether or not it was going to, uh, whether or not it was going to leave defense in place, which matched the Fiscal Responsibility Act levels of a $28 billion increase, left intact the spending levels for veterans, which was a part of the discussion and agreement, and then had an 8% across the board cut to match the Fiscal Responsibility Act levels. 
That was the actual design of that bill two weeks ago that my colleagues opposed. It was literally designed to, within some degree of rounding errors and, and fractional percentages, match the Fiscal Responsibility Act. That's my point. My colleagues disagree with that. Why? Because, and understandably, with respect to the point about, okay, it's an across-the-board cut, not surgical cuts. But that's the point. When we're talking about something in, turn, in terms of continuing to perpetuate government and perpetuating government funding, which is the debate here, is whether or not you're going to actually reduce spending in the process of doing so. This legislation is designed to do that. Mm -hmm. This is These are bigger cuts, and that's what we're trying to move forward with. Okay. I yield back. Okay. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman, our gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And one, I want to uh, thank the gentleman from uh, Texas for acknowledging that under the Biden administration, we've actually had growth. We've fought in more revenues. And the reason we've done that is we've actually also increased the jobs in this country. So that is the direction that America wants to head. Thank you for pointing that out about the increased revenue. And I want to go back to what, what we do have in front of us is a bill that Republicans in the Senate have already conveyed to you they are not interested in doing. Your own Republican leader in the Senate has said that we should not be playing with a shutdown and we should look at the CR that the Senate has sent over to us that is indeed following this Fiscal Responsibility Act. So the fact that the Republicans of the House won't talk to the Democrats is one thing. The fact that you don't even talk to your colleagues on the other side of this building is outrageous because they've already told you, as quoting Minority Leader McConnell, back in 2019, our colleagues found, a, found out that these government shutdowns cost the payer nearly $4 billion. He pointed out that it's not Cutting the government, shutting it down is not a choice. And when you do what you are headed to do, you hurt everybody in the process. Everybody in the process. And saying every time we point out to you that you're drastic, draconian, harmful, hurtful, and I would say shameful, shameful. And one of the, I've said this before, one of the worst insults and the Spanish language you can give in northern New Mexico is to say sin vergüenza, without shame. And the manner in which this bill has no shame in hurting those most vulnerable should make us all weep. There is no shame in hurting the children who rely on RIF. There is no shame in saying, why are we doing this? Because we want to slash public education policy. Slash a public education policy. That is what you're doing with this CR. That is what you're doing with the bills that you are considering. Cutting Social Security. We do have an answer on cutting Social Security. There's a bill called Social Security 2100, which leads to its financial solvency by, what? by making sure that everybody pays into Social Security, that you do not leave out the wealthy, because time and time again, and the American people know this, that what you do is you say, we are going to make those who are trying to get to the middle class, who are in the middle class, who are in the working class, who are working every day and it's so hard, we're going to make it even harder for them so we can protect the wealthy, so we can protect the corporations, many of the biggest who don't pay any tax. But what that Social Security 2100 does is say, let's make sure everybody pays Social Security taxes. Isn't that kind of a fair thing, since we all benefit? Since we all benefit from having, a, having our elders not go into poverty? That's what existed before Social Security. So we have a plan. We've set it out. I don't think any of you. Our co-sponsors, is anyone, if anybody is a co-sponsor on the other side of Social Security 2100, would you raise your hand? Nobody has raised their hand because none of them are looking at a solution to Social Security which creates solvency and also makes sure that everybody pays. The other thing that what you're doing with this shutdown, remember, why are they doing this? We heard it over and over again in this house. It is to enact 
the kind of abortion bans that affect women nationally everywhere. So slashing public funding, cutting Social Security, making sure that women don't have the kind of choice and don't have the access to reproductive health care that they need. That is the why we're doing this. And then when you look at what it actually means, you know, the idea that we're going to have a 30% cut, ask any business owner, can you go from one day to the next and all of a sudden saying, we are going to cut 30% of what you're doing, 30% of your people working in making things, it doesn't work. You know, and in rural America, time and time again, I asked it on this, you know, I asked the chair as he was sitting, how come we're not prioritizing, what, how come we're not prioritizing rural America? We have to prioritize, and you are not prioritizing rural America. Department of Agriculture in my New Mexico alone, my beautiful, beautiful New Mexico and that, those gorgeous rural areas, $51 million. Shutdown impacts. These shutdown impacts are just huge. The gentleman yield for unanimous Please. consent request. I want to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a political argument a, a article that just appeared today entitled WIC, Rural Support Programs Will Be First to Feel the Pain as Clock Clicks Down to a Shutdown. Thank you. Without the, objection. The first to feel the pain. The first to feel the pain are those who are working, those who are living in the places that give us our food, in the places that give us our identity as America, the first to feel the pain, those living in rural America. That is where the Republicans are headed. And it's just Head Start. Head Start, cutting Head Start. I'm a Head Start baby, I love Head Start. But besides the fact that it's my alma mater, it makes a difference in the future. So when you cut Head Start, when you cut Title I funding, you are cutting America's future. You are refusing to invest in our future to protect the wealthy, to protect the corporations, because you don't ever talk about what are we going to do in terms of raise taxes. You talk about continuing the Trump tax cuts, Trump tax cuts, which led us so much into this fiscal problem that you have created. Uh, I urge my colleagues, and I know those of us on that side of the aisle will vote against this CR because we really do hold dear the American people, and we respect the employees who work to keep our food safe, who work to keep the planes up in the air, who work to educate our children, who work to protect us. Law enforcement and tribal nations, the cuts to that, that we're going to see in this, we already have a pandemic of missing and murdered women, indigenous women, and we're going to add to that with these kinds of cuts. Uh, the list goes on, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, a, a very saddened member of this committee, when I think of the communities that will be hurt, yields back. Thank you very much. Before I move to my friend from Minnesota, I think, who had... Nope. Okay. The um, gentleman from uh, Kentucky is recognized. I'll just be very, very brief. We've, we've had 30 percent cuts to all of these programs under this Congress. It's it's shameless for us to hit, sit here and ignore the effect of inflation on people who have fixed incomes and uh, people at the lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum have seen 30% cuts in the last four years due to inflation. So it seems somewhat uh, lacking in situational awareness for us to sit here and, and not understand the impact that all of the spending has had on on. American, every American. Would the gentleman uh, yield? No, I will not. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. I mean, and I'm, I'll implicate our former president and our current president uh, for this. But mostly, I want to implicate this body, Congress, for spending far more than we bring in and then directing the Federal Reserve to print money. And it has caused pain among everybody, whether you're you're getting money from the government or working for that money. It's all worth 30% less in the last four years. Gentlemen, yield. Uh, I'm, I'm going to yield my 
Yeah, I'll, I'll yield. I just strongly co-sponsored the remarks of my friend from Kentucky. I yield back. Thanks. Mark? Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Oh, gentleman from South Carolina. Thank I'll you. be brief, but uh, Ms. Ledger, Fernandez, I quoted you as you mentioned shameful, feel the pain, uh, and un unable to invest in the future. What this bill has in it is the most comprehensive um, enforcement of our border that those dead children from the fentanyl that's coming across that your administration has fostered. There are no treatment centers and morgues. How do they get to feel the pain? They don't. Um, the Social Security that you mentioned, that the illegals, when your party is given Social Security numbers, your party is given driver's licenses, your party is fostering an invasion of this country, I resent you even bringing, I mean, let's, y'all address that. You won't do it. Uh, Mr. Goose, you mentioned the, the uh, American people are watching. Absolutely. They're watching the border that's out of control. They're watching a city in New York, which is a self-proclaimed sanctuary city, now scream about the, um, the veterans that are getting kicked out of the nursing homes, the hotel rooms that are being trashed, all in, this, all in the name of power, your party. And you mentioned you need more time to read it. It's under Ms. Pelosi, who said, you got to pass it, and then you can read it. Y'all supported her, those of you who were here. So don't tell me about shameful. Don't tell me about feeling pain. Don't tell me about... Um, you know, not investing in the future. Um, as Mr. Massey has mentioned, the American people are feeling pain at the pump, at the grocery store, and at every level. And so, um, you know, th there's no pain that you feel for that good friend of mine who got shot by an illegal, and that's continuing to the, the, the brutality that's uh, continuing to occur. None of your body, body, when you mention the border, is crickets. It's that's shameful. And you tell that to those mothers who are losing, losing children. You tell that to that police officer who doesn't come home. You say that. You can say words, but that's all it is. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. We, I thank the chairman. First, let me just say, again, facts are facts. Your bill defunds federal law enforcement efforts. That's, I'm not making that up. That's in your bill. That's in this CR. DEA agents, FBI agents. That, that's what, and I'm not going to yield. I'm going to make my statement. That's in this bill. So, you know, you can talk about fentanyl interdiction and supporting law enforcement, which I certainly support. Your bill does not. Now, second thing I will say, you, you referenced uh, a quote from the former speaker. I find it laughable that anyone would attempt to characterize the changes to this CR as minor. It's just that it's not a big deal. It's only one line of text. I think someone said it over there. $119 billion is how much you cut from the prior CR that this committee considered. $119 billion. If I asked you in detail to describe to me the litany of cuts and the impacts that that $119 billion would have, I suspect you would not have all the answers. And that's not based off of my supposition. Ranking Member McGovern asked a pretty simple question. He said, how many mothers on WIC would be impacted by this bill? He's yet to get an answer. There are a plethora of other questions we could pose about that $119 billion. And here's the point. I mean, this is actually, you can tell a bit more animated about this, because I actually have great respect for my colleague, the, the chief deputy whip, and you know, he's got a case to make, and he's making it. And, I, and if the shoe was on the other foot, I actually don't know that he would necessarily, I don't want to uh, speak for him, but you know, I, I don't know that he would criticize the majority for making this kind of late change, putting in a massive monetary change within the bill and putting that on the floor. But I know who would criticize it. Some of the newer members to this committee would criticize it. Thomas Jefferson, once says a great quote, 
that in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. And my surprise is with those of you who, again, claim to be proponents of regular order, bemoan the prior administrations of this House and the way in which bills are brought to the floor, and then try to convince us or the American people with a straight face that $119 billion in cuts from the prior bill that you submitted is just a line of text. That will, that will live in infamy in the same way that you describe some of the quotes from prior speakers and prior houses. What you just said, this notion that it's just one or two texts of, you know, of, of a bill, one or two lines, excuse me, of a bill. It's not a, not a big deal. Members should be aware of this. I, I, don't, I think that's, that is not the way to govern, certainly. And I happen to believe that my members or my colleagues, I think, if they're being candid with themselves and with each other, would concede the same. I will say I do give uh, credit where credit is due, you know, to Mr. Roy's point uh, and, and the quote about uh, from Thomas Jefferson and standing on principle, because at least, again, you're, you were intellectually honest about your positions as it relates to Social Security and Medicare. And so, it, you know, I, I don't, I was hoping some of your colleagues would say that, you know, I, I would, uh, would provide that same level of candor. And I was surprised, that's why, as I started off my remarks this morning, uh, from that place, because you, you know it's unpopular, but you say it anyway, because you believe that to be the case. And, uh, you know, I, I happen to believe that several of your colleagues <laughs> believe the same thing, but they're unwilling to say that publicly. So in any event, I, we've uh, I've probably belabored the point here, and I, I will yield back to the chairman. Well, Chair. the chair is always I'll, interested I'll, in, really in listening to his good friend. Let the chair make a point. I just remind everybody on both sides, we are far off the amendment the gentleman from Massachusetts offered. And <laughs> as, as wonderful as the dialogue and discussion is, I would ask us to refocus back on uh, Mr. McGovern's amendment. And obviously, if you have other amendments, they're going to be entertained and people will have an opportunity to make their points. But uh, with that, the gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized. Well, I think the amendment, uh, uh, as he was discussing the amendment, discussed the issue of the bill as well. And just, just to point out, I did want to, to reemphasize the funding. So we do believe in putting our, our mouth for, and actually taking action. And last year, and last year's budgets, and budgets do reflect values. And so I think we've been reflecting values in the budgets we passed in the last uh, two years. We increased funding for law enforcement. We increase funding for fentanyl interdiction. And so that actually does address the problem. It does look at it. Uh, so in this bill, we're decreasing and defunding the kind of law enforcement that will work on making sure that we do interdict uh, fentanyl. We also, sadly, oftentimes, people who are uh, addicted or seeking out uh, drugs Sometimes they're in crises. Uh, we need mental health funding. And this also slashes resources for the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. I have heard across my district how useful that has been. Once again, we are making the most vulnerable even more vulnerable. And as I mentioned, the cut uh, in law enforcement, 29.9% uh, um, of cutting the BIA uh, oftentimes, uh, and I know in my district, uh, I, I represent the Navajo Nation, the Hikari Apache Nation, 16 Pueblos. They are often assisting because some t drugs do go through there as well. So if when you start cutting law enforcement, when you cut the safer communities programs, that's in our rural areas where they're suffering from fentanyl. So what we are doing is indeed putting the resources, not just talking about it and blaming you know, blaming immigrants at the border when your own Cato Institute has said that's not where we're getting fentanyl. I quote this all the time because your conservative organization has already <laughs> said it's, it's really not coming in with asylum seekers. They are simply seeking asylum. Um, that we are indeed taking action to address these problems. That is the difference. And with that, I yield back.
Thank you very much. The chair is uh, very sad to announce uh, there are unconfirmed reports of the passing of Senator Feinstein. Uh, so uh, I know uh, many of us had the opportunity to deal with her, and certainly all of us on both sides of the aisle respect her. I would ask before we proceed that we observe a moment of silence in uh, recognition and memory of our colleague on the other side of the rotunda. Chairman, I just want to I appreciate you doing that. Um, uh, many of us have had the opportunity and the honor of working with Senator Feinstein. She was a, a great leader, a great uh, fighter for the rights of women, for all people in this country, and um, it's, uh, it's a loss for our country. So thank you. Uh, thank you. It's certainly a very superb public servant and a very honorable individual. Is there uh, any further discussion on the amendment? Mercifully hearing none. <laughs> the question is on the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chair, I ask for a roll call. A roll call uh, has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Neguse. Aye. Mr. Neguse, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Absolutely aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. The noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. No further amendments. Gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee amend the rule to add a provision to provide for same-day authority, since regular order apparently is no longer of interest on the other side. Um, starting on October 1st for the Senate amendment to H.R. 3935, the Securing Growth and Robust Leadership in American Aviation Act, the Legislative Vehicle for the Continuing Appropriations Act 2024 and Other Extensions Act. Mr. Chairman, I offer this amendment to the rule because if the Senate sends us a bipartisan CR, something the House has been unable to achieve, we shouldn't wait one minute longer than necessary to consider a bill to reopen the government. Any shutdown of our government, even a relatively short one, will cause damage to individuals, to our economy, to our international standing. A shutdown will cause economic damage, including to our brave service members, our Capitol Hill police, border patrol agents, children, family, veterans, seniors worried about paying their bills and putting food on the table. So I offer this amendment to allow for us to quickly take up any measure that is sent over by the Senate to open our shuttered government, because let's be real here, the majority's actions have guaranteed a shutdown. Providing same-day authority for consideration of this legislation is exactly the type of emergency this authority was designed for. I hope everyone on the committee will join me in voting in support of this amendment, and I yield back. Any further discussion? Is there any further discussion uh, on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. No. Aye. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Neguse. Aye. Mr. Neguse, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. The noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no request for further amendments, the questions on the motion to report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I ask for a roll call. Roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler. Aye. Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey, aye. Mr. Norman. Aye. Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy, aye. Mrs. Houchin. Aye. Mrs. Houchin, aye. Mr. Langworthy. 
Mr. Langworthy, aye. Mr. McGovern? No. Mr. McGovern, no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose, no. Ms. Ledger Fernandez? No. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, no. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, four nays. The ayes have it. The motion to report is agreed to. Accordingly, Mr. Reschenthaler will be managing the rule for the majority. And at this moment, I will. Uh, and uh, my good friend, Mr. McGovern, it should be a lively, it should be must-see television. Uh, so I look forward to that debate. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Uh, certainly, my if I, if I just could take a, a moment here. Um, I, I just I want to take a moment to recognize um, Adam Duffy, uh, who's a member of our staff whose uh, last day with the committee is today. Where, where you, where you behind, where is behind me here, right? Uh, Adam began working for our office in the fall of 2021 originally as an intern, then as a staff assistant, and most recently as a policy assistant. And he has been an indis indispensable part of our team over the last few years, and his attention to detail and his willingness to collaborate will be missed. Adam's next adventure will reconnect him with his home state of Ohio, where he will be working for his alma mater, Ohio, Ohio State University. Uh, though we are sad to, uh, to see Adam go, go uh, I think we could all agree that we envy uh, his ability to get out there and just uh, just in the nick of time before the uh, government shutdown, I, I said that he should run um, <laughs> away from this place. But uh, I, I do think um, you know, and I and not only I say this about Adam, but our team and your team too. I mean, uh, we put our staff through an awful lot, um, and uh, we should uh, never uh, refuse to take a moment to thank them for all that they do and. Uh, we're we're going to say goodbye to Adam, but we appreciate his service, but we appreciate the service of all of our staff. Absolutely. Before we give Adam the appropriate recognition, uh, could I make one correction? He's a graduate of the Ohio State <laughs> University. Uh, we've played him a couple times, and we have enormous respect for the Ohio State University. So with that... If Joyce Beatty were here, she would correct me just like you did, so oh, thank you. Absolutely. I'll note we did win the last encounter, but hey... Uh, we, won't, we won't talk about the one before that. Uh, I think Adam deserves applause and recognition. <laughs> and we appreciate that, and I thank my friend as always. For, he, uh, nobody cares more about the staff around here than my friend, the distinguished uh, ranking member. So again, we look forward to uh, the encounter, the debate, and without objection, the committee's adjourned.